Well, good morning and welcome to River Church. I'm Pastor Randy Caulfield and you've joined us on a special day, a rather unique day. Uh, this is Sunday, May 31st, and this is the first Sunday after 11 weeks. Uh, this is the first Sunday in which we're doing video worship uh, and we're also regathering for public worship right here. Uh, so at 11 a.m., uh, this is a little, little ahead of time, but at 11 a.m., uh, those who are comfortable will be gathering here for our public worship. And I'm, I'm excited about seeing those faces as, as I'm excited about joining you right now. Listen, maybe you're staying at home because you're just not ready to get out. You're, you're, you're still, um, your comfort level isn't there yet. And uh, I support you in that decision. I say go with your conscience. And so, so I'm, I'm glad you're staying home if that's where you're at right now. And, and so that's why I'm going to be making these videos every week. Uh, and so, so that you can be a part of what we're doing here each and every Sunday. You can watch it at home as we're worshiping here publicly. Maybe you're staying at home because of your, uh, you fall into a vulnerable category because of your age. Uh, and again, I support you in that decision. I understand. Uh, soon enough, we'll be back together, all of us. But for now, I just want you to feel included because of this video. And that's why I'm making this each and every week. Uh, maybe you're staying at home because you're vulnerable based on your health condition. Again, I support you in that decision. I think that's the best, the wisest decision for you. Maybe you're not feeling well and, and you're just out of, out of respect for everyone else. You'd say, I've got a little tickle in my throat or I'm just not feeling quite right. I encourage you to stay home and take advantage of this video. Uh, maybe you're staying at home because you like worshiping in your pajamas. And I don't know that I support that decision. Uh, I'm glad you're with us today. Maybe next week you want to come check us out in person at 11 a.m. on Sunday. Maybe you're a little concerned about bringing your kids here. I want you to know that we are, we've got tables set up and colors uh, and we're gonna be preaching sermons and singing songs, keeping in mind the fact that we have kids in the service. And, and so your kids aren't gonna be a bother or a distraction. We're all in this together. And so I encourage you, lead your family, bring them here and let's worship together. So if you are, uh, if, if, if you're getting ready to, to worship with us this morning, I encourage you to get a Bible and get a, a notepad and get something to write with. We're studying a, a new book, the book of James, and I'm going to be throwing a lot of scriptures at you, and you need to be able to turn there and follow along. Get rid of distractions. Maybe go fill up your coffee cup as we get ready to worship. Uh, if you need to communicate with me or one of the other elders, uh, send us an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. Maybe you're new to River Church. You got some questions, you need some help. Send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. And we want to dialogue with you. We want to help you in any way we can. We want to get you connected with other people and make some new friends here at River Church. Um, okay, well, I, I think that's it. Uh, we'll get started here in a minute. So again, glad you're with us this morning. Today we're beginning a new series. We're going to be studying the book of James uh, during the summer months. So several months we'll spend in this book. And there are two critical words that really summarize the book for me. Uh, and they're two of my favorite words when used together. The two words, I, I love these words in a phrase together. The two words are love and justice. Love and justice. Listen, if, you, if you're going to have twins in the next few years, you got to consider those names, solid names, love and justice. Uh, I'll take a little credit for that if you, if, you, if you choose to name your kids love and justice. I would, I would consider that. Uh, they're just that cool. Uh, a couple, couple of my favorite words. And yet, they're kind of hard to define. They're all over the Bible, they're all throughout the book of James, and yet love and justice. We tend to know what they are, we spot them when we see them, but a little harder to find. Let's talk about those two words because they're so important in our study. Let's talk about them briefly. Love. The word love, uh, I would define it in this way. Love is the, the giving of oneself over to another. So when you give yourself over to someone else, that's love. Now, if I, if I ask some of the kids that are going to be in the audience here later on this morning, went to a child and I said, what is love? Can you define for me love? Well, well he, she would say, we, we might have trouble uh, putting it to words, but, but he or she would say, I love my mommy. My mommy loves me. Yes, love is, is giving oneself over to another. Um, God's love for us 
is this eternal giving himself over to us, making himself available to us. Uh, that's, that's God's love, eternally giving himself to others. Our love for God is, is, is our giving of ourselves over to God in, in, in worship and, 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 and in life in general. We, we give ourselves to God. Now, now, justice is maybe even a little harder than that to define. Justice, again, we, we know it when we see it. And we know injustice when we see it. But it's a little hard to define. Uh, one, one good description of, of, of justice, really justice is just another way of describing God's righteousness. Meaning that, that God always does right. God is in the business of righting wrongs. In other, in other words, when people are, are, are taken advantage of, when the weak are oppressed, when vulnerable, vulnerable people are mistreated, God, God is in the business of righting those wrongs because God is all about justice. God's commitment to always doing what, what's right and his commitment to seeing human beings do right by one another. When we wrong one another, when we, when we hurt one another, when we mistreat one another, that's injustice. Um, in elementary school, uh, one child is picked upon by the entire class, and there's this sense of that's not right, that's unjust. God has always had a heart for those who are mistreated, for those who are kicked around and taken advantage of, because God is committed to justice. Um, it's most easily defined, as you see, by, by way of example, uh, just a, the, the just treatment of the weak and the mistreated. and The little boy at your school that, that, that everybody makes fun of, that everybody picks upon. And, and inside, there's just this sense of, like, that's not right. That's unjust. Um, we all, every one of us, uh, young and old alike, we have what I'm going to call a justice meter inside of us. And we spot injustice all the time. You see an instance where when someone is, is being mistreated or taken advantage of, and you, and you say, ah, that's, that's not right. That's, that's unjust. That one guy, he's, he's, he's doing that other guy wrong. It's unfair. It's inequitable. It's discriminatory. And that's the heart of God in us. When we feel that way, those are, those are the feelings and the commitments of God because God's heart is for justice and God's heart is for love. For us as a society, for us as human beings, God, he wants us to, to do justice and to love kindness. Uh, Micah chapter 6, it's in the Old Testament. Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says this, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? That's a good question. What does the Lord require of us? Uh, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. So doing justice and loving kindness, they're, they're two sides of like the same coin. And this coin represents all that God stands for, all that God is committed to, all that God wants for us as a society, love and justice. It's the heart of God. Now, what if we only had one of those two components? What if we only had love, for instance? Love in a community without justice. Um, and you, and you, you let people uh, get away with everything and, 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 and you let people take advantage of one another. Love without justice, those people who are loving, they, they get railroaded. They get taken, taken advantage of and mistreated. Now, on the other hand, what if you just have the component of justice in a, in a society, in a community, but no love? Um, if, you, if you only have justice, uh, then, 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 then we have a community that's cold, a community that's cruel and uncaring, lacking in mercy, so, so love without justice and, and people are exploited and taken advantage of. But justice without love and it's just cold and cruel and impersonal and lacking in mercy. But you put those together, man, that is a solid, a solid combination, love and justice. 
And the study that we're going to be doing over the next several months uh, is going to lead us, I, I, I believe, to, to realize that, that the acts of love and justice in the life of the believer, the Christ follower, the children of God, the acts of love and justice in our lives, they, they are evidence uh, that, that, that we're children of God, that we have been justified by God. And therefore, we have new hearts. We used to have hearts of stone. Now we have hearts that, that are committed to love and justice. 2 Corinthians 5 says it this way. God made Jesus Christ sin so that he might make us righteous. In other, words, in other words, God put our sin on Jesus and he became for us sin. And then God took Jesus' righteousness and put it on us. Therefore, we are now the righteousness of Christ. We didn't earn it, deserve it, accomplish it. It's just something that God did. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, so, so when Jesus took on my sin, I was forgiven. But there's, there's way more to the gospel story than just that. I was not only forgiven, but I received the righteousness of Christ. Well, what does that mean? That means that, that as God is always about doing right, now, now I have that commitment. Now I have that capacity to, to do right. Uh, not on my own merit, not on my own abilities, but because of what Christ has done for me, um, forgiven me and made me righteous. So now I'm able to do justice and I'm able to love kindness at a level that I never would have been able to achieve before and on my own. The whole of the Old Testament, and especially the, the writings of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Amos, uh, but the whole of the Old Testament, they tell us that, that if, if, if I am not intensely concerned for the quartet of the vulnerable, the quartet of the vulnerable, what, is it, what am I talking about? Probably haven't ever heard that before. The quartet of the vulnerable, it's the four different types of people in the Bible that are considered vulnerable, and God's heart is for them. They are the, the orphan, the widow, the, the immigrant, and the poor. And I'll say it in a different order. The widow, the orphan, the, the immigrant, or the foreigner, and the poor. And, and in the Old Testament, we're going to see this, in the Old Testament, it tells us that, that, that if, if I'm not intensely concerned for the quartet of, of the vulnerable, widow, orphan, foreigner, or immigrant, and the poor, if I'm not intensely concern, concerned about them and their condition, then my heart is, isn't right. It, it's not about obeying some law, some rule that you've got to take care of those people. It's the, the, the Old Testament teaches us that, that, that when our hearts are right with God, our hearts are beating with God's heart, we're righteous, therefore committed to doing what's right, then, 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 then the, the, an evidence of that is that our heart, we're intensely concerned for the quartet of the vulnerable. But if we, if we have no concern for, for those vulnerable people, then, then there's something wrong with the condition of our heart. It's not that we're supposed to be following the rules, but we have a heart condition. Isaiah 58, pretty famous passage in the Old Testament. Uh, it shows a disconnect uh, in the lives of people that say they're following God. A disconnect between the practice of, of fasting, that's where you give up food, and fasting has always been uh, an, an example of, of repentance. I want to turn from my sin and I want to follow God. And so we fast, we give up food for a period of time. So Isaiah 58, it, it, it paints this picture of a disconnect in the, life, in the lives of people who are fasting. Um, it's supposed to be repentance, um, but they aren't caring or concerned about the immigrant and the poor and the widow and the vulnerable. And, um, if you're really a child of God, then your heart, it, 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 it's concerned for those people. So Isaiah 58, it says this. 
He says, no, this kind of fast, this is the kind of fasting I want. This is the kind of fasting I want, God says. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry. Uh, Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. This is Isaiah 58. I started in verse 6. It says, Then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. The, The heart of God for those imprisoned, for those oppressed, Uh, for those who are bound by chains, for those who are hungry and homeless and in need. Another passage in Isaiah, it's 29, chapter 29, verse 13. I'll simply summarize it. It says this, it says, When people don't show a concern for the poor, uh, though their mouths give God lip service, like I'm I'm talking all about God, but I don't show concern for the poor, then, then what it means is that my, my heart is actually far from him. I'll read a portion of it. It says, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Whew. That's an indictment. God's heart for, for love and justice. What does he require of us? That we, that we do justice and that we love kindness. Um, what's God calling us out of? He's calling us out of religious hypocrisy. Another passage, Deuteronomy 10, verse 19. Um, You can look at that later or turn there now, but I'll summarize it. Uh, God says this, don't mistreat the foreigner, uh, the the immigrant, the traveler. Don't don't mistreat the foreigner, which is just a form of racism. They're they're not like me. Um, And he says the reason that God gives for not mistreating the foreigner is so interesting. He says, don't mistreat uh, the foreigner because you were once a foreigner. And then he paints this picture of us being spiritual foreigners. Outside of the family of God, outcast, unsaved, but then we're saved. We're invited into the family of God and we're no longer strangers and aliens and foreigners. We're now now members uh, or family members. We're children of God. And so a Christian uh, deeply concerned for, uh, gracious toward the foreigner. Why? Because God has been gracious toward us and has welcomed us home. And now we should be intensely concerned with being gracious toward foreigners uh, as well. That comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19. So our new study uh, in the book of James, it's all about love and justice. And, and that's what we're going to be highlighting over the, over the summer months. Um, love and justice. Not only could you name your babies that, <laughs> uh, I think it'd be a great name for a church. In fact, I've done my research. I've known this for a few years. Uh, there was a church called Love and Justice Church. It was in Oklahoma. They actually changed their name. They merged with another church. And so that name is, it's up for grabs again. It's available again. So I don't know if I was ever to plant another church, I might go with that name, Love and Justice Church. It's just that awesome of a pairing. And it's, it's what God's heart is set on. Now, when described in the Bible, uh, the writers, the writers uh, often explain that, that in contrast to God's heart for love and justice. In contrast to that, God, on the other hand, has always been, uh, he's always hated uh, religious posing, religious faking. God's heart is against that. He, he pushes against religious posing and, and faking, and, and we don't like that either, do we? Uh, we call it hypocrisy. You say, you're such a hypocrite. Amos 5 paints that picture. Listen to what God says. He says, I hate, I despise your, your religious feasts. He says feasts, but he's talking about the religious gatherings. And I, I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. God's, God's calling out the religious. And that's some of us. 
He says, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Your peace offerings of the fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away, uh, take away from me the noise of your songs, God says. To, to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. And then he says this, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. God says, oh, take away from me the noise of your worship songs. Oh, the, the, the band just sounds like noise to me. Why? Why? Because there's, there's such injustice that you're allowing. God says, take away from me the noise and instead let justice roll down like waters. Righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Now this was written uh, to the nation of Israel in a time of extravagance, in a time of corruption, uh, at that moment in time, when, when God speaks these words, the rich and the powerful were, were oppressing the poor and the weak. And God's heart is for the vulnerable. Yeah, we learn that God can't stomach religious hypocrisy. Um, the example that God gives is the rich taking advantage of the poor. We see it throughout the Old Testament. What does God require of us? That we do justice and that we love kindness. But do you think that might also be found in the, in the New Testament? Probably so, right? Uh, if it's in the Old Testament, probably God's heart is the same in the New Testament. Um, and it is. We see that. Jesus repeatedly chastises, calls out religious crowds uh, with, with the same accusation. Uh, you don't care for the quartet of the vulnerable. The widow, the orphan, the foreigner, and the poor. Luke 11, verse 42 says this, What sorrow awaits you Pharisees? Now this is Jesus speaking to Pharisees. They are religious, the religious elite. They never missed a Sunday. <laughs> or in their case, a Saturday. Um, he says, What sorrow awaits you Pharisees? For you are careful to tithe even the, the, even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. But you ignore justice. And you ignore the love of God. You should tithe. Like, don't stop tithing. You should tithe, yes. But do not neglect the more important things. He goes on. What sorrow awaits uh, you Pharisees. For you love to sit in the seats of honor and in the synagogues and receive respectful greetings as you walk in the marketplaces. Uh, yes, what sorrow awaits you, for you are like hidden graves in the field. People walk over them without knowing the corruption they are stepping on. Wow. Then in, 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 in uh, the, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus, Jesus speaks to the religious folks and he speaks very similar uh, Sort of, sort of language. He says this, Beware of the religious leaders who, who walk around in long robes and take the high seats in the religious centers, but they devour widows' houses. Whew. This commitment to love and justice, we see it in the Old Testament, uh, and we, we see it in the New Testament, we, we see it in the teachings of Jesus, uh, but nowhere... Is this more clear than in the book of James? Um, so, so today, that's what we're doing. We're, we're going to just, just an overview of, of the book of James. And then next week, we start with a verse-by-verse -verse study. So let's jump in, just an overview, and see what James has to say. Okay, in, the la in this last section, I want to give you a brief overview of the book of James, and that will help us over the next several months as we study it in detail. So the author of James, uh, his name is James, he, he's, he's the guy that wrote it. Uh, the problem is it doesn't expressly state who this James is. Uh, yet over throughout history, most biblical scholars uh, would, would agree, believe that this James is, is James, the brother of Jesus. Imagine that he grew up with Jesus. Uh, we know that he wasn't converted to Christianity until after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, how could you believe your brother was God, right? Uh, but it makes perfectly good sense to me that James, who grew up with Jesus, has the same commitment that Jesus has to, to, to the poor and the outcast and the needy 
Uh, so, so this is the James that we uh, believe wrote the Bible, the, uh, wrote, wrote the book of James, uh, Jesus' brother. And uh, he's got this commitment to love and justice. Uh, in fact, it's more poignant, this commitment to love and justice, than perhaps any other writing in scriptures. Um, listen to this, James chapter 2, verse 14. Here's what James says. Again, we're just going to be bouncing around a little bit today in James. James 2, verse 14. Hear the heart of James. He says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Okay, so James says uh, there's this type of faith that is a, a dead faith. It's a lifeless, useless sort of faith. It's, it's a really a, a faith that's just posing and, and faking and, and hypocritical. Faith without works, he says, is dead. Okay, but, but, but what kind of works? Uh, what kind of works that James says that these works will be, will be evidence that, that prove that your faith isn't dead? Um, what kind of works? Well, real clear. He says, your care for the poor. You see people without resources, or people who are under-resourced, uh, people in need, and you have this concern for them. You, you help them. You go out of your way to help them. And, and James says, ah, that's evidence that your faith is genuine. It's not that your works, that your good service saves you. In fact, when you're not a, when you're not a believer, good works, they, they come harder because you don't have the righteousness of Christ in you. But James is saying, now, now that you're a person of faith, the, righteous, the righteousness of Christ has been placed on you. Now, what's going to happen? The evidence is you're going to care for the poor. You're going to help the under-resourced. That's James chapter 2. Um, so so the, big, the big question is, over the next several months, we're going to be asking... Um, is my, is my life marked uh, by love and justice? Uh, as I lead you as, as the pastor of River Church, we're going to be asking this. Are we as a church committed to love and justice? I mean, we're positioned right here on the border for a reason, right? We've got to believe that. It's not random. We're a church here uh, on the border, on the international border, for some purpose. There are not many places uh, you could live where love and justice is more needed than right here on the border. James says to us, as international border dwellers, living among the poor, the immigrant, the fatherless, the, the husbandless, and that's what we got here on the border, on the river by the sea. Um, and James says in this writing, faith without works is useless. It's lifeless. It's dead. And he says something else. James says something else in this book. Uh, if I can leave you with this one thought this morning and just kind of let it hang there and Maybe we can just meditate on it throughout the week. Um, it's a very similar statement, but he says one other thing. James says this. He says, be a doer of the word and not merely a hearer of the word who deceives himself. He says it in James chapter 1, verse 22. He says this, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Uh, for if you listen to the word and you don't obey the word, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. 
That's James chapter 1, verses 22 through 24. What's James saying? James is contrasting the, the doing of the word uh, with, with being a mere hearer of the word. You can just be a hearer or you can be a, a doer of God's word. In other words, hearing, hearing God's word equals looking in the mirror and not doing God's word equals walking away from that mirror and forgetting what you saw. So a hearer just looks in the mirror, sees it, says, okay, I got it, walks away and then just forgets what he or she saw. That's not doing the word. It's a symbol. Now, I think we can all relate. I know that I can. We, we have some sort of spiritual aha moment in God's word, in scripture. I've been reading through God's word on a daily basis, and I, all the time I have these aha moments, like, okay, I see what God's saying. I see what he's calling me to, an aha moment. And then, then sadly, we walk away and we, we forget. It's like walking away from the mirror and you forget what you saw. We walk away from God's word and we, like, we forget. We, we felt so strongly about that. And then we walk away and, and it's, it's, it's called hypocrisy. It's called self-deception. Now, in this pandemic era that we're living in, I believe I'm hearing God calling me. Yes, I believe God is calling us, River Church, to a deeper level of authenticity. Authenticity with ourselves, uh, being honest with myself, a, a deeper level of authenticity with one another, me being honest with you, you being honest with me, and and, and a deeper level of authenticity with God. Honesty with myself, honesty with you, and, and honesty with God about how I'm doing spiritually. Okay, so we're positioned here on the border, on the river. We've got immigrants. We've, we've got orphans. We've got ladies with no husbands. We have got the poor in abundance. So what's God calling us to? If we're going to be authentic with one another, honest with each other and with God about our spirituality, about our spiritual condition individually and as a church, what's God calling us to? That's what I'm considering. That's what I'm praying about. That's what we're going to be talking about over the next several months. Come, let's, let's go together on this journey through the book of James. I invite you this morning to the table of communion. Maybe you're by yourself um, and you're gonna serve yourself. Know that God is with you. Know that there are people all over Brownsville and Cameron County celebrating communion online with you. And so we do this together. I invite you to the table of communion. Maybe you're with your family and you can serve one another here in just a few moments. We come to the table of communion today for the very reason that, 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 that the righteousness of Christ is found in what he did on the cross for us. In other words, we're talking about all this doing stuff. Like, I want to I I do justice. I want to love kindness. All this, all this action, all these good works. But, but there's, that, that is so tiring. That is so difficult. That is so uh, life-taking trying to follow rules. But, but if God has saved us through Christ's work on the cross, then, then we, are, we are now empowered with the righteousness of, righteousness of Christ. And, 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 and God is committed to doing right. We live that same commitment in the power and presence of Christ in our lives. And so that's why we come to the table of communion. We run to the table of communion. We celebrate Jesus' work on the cross. On the night Jesus was to be betrayed, he held up the bread and he held up the cup. And he said, from now on when you do this, do this remembering me. He took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body broken for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he held up the cup and he offered it. And he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. For as often as you do this, break the bread and drink the cup. Do so, Jesus said, remembering me. And so Jesus, that's what we do this morning. We celebrate you.
You were no victim. You were a conqueror. You, con you, you defeated sin. You defeated death. And so we celebrate you. We come to the table of communion today, giving thanks for all that you've done for us. So I invite you now, right there in the privacy of your own home, break the bread, drink from the cup, and celebrate, this, celebrate the goodness of God in Jesus Christ. Well, okay. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you joined us today. I, I'm honored that you let me into your home. Um, we're going to continue do the, doing this each and every week. Those of you that are not yet ready to return to public worship, these videos, uh, the, the worship service will be available online just like this. I'm, I'm happy to serve you in this way, and I'm, I'm honored that you would, you would receive this gift from me and from us as a church. Uh, listen, if you want to know more about River Church, go to our website, riverchurchrgv.com. Um, all things River Church can be found there. If you're wondering how you can get connected, how you can join, where we're located, riverchurchrgv.com. If you have any questions, maybe God's been moving in your heart today and you want to, you want to know more, send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. Um, now is a good time to, to go online and, and give. Uh, you can give your tithes and your offerings um, on our website. It's safe. It's intuitive, it's uh, secure, it's fast and easy. Uh, go there and give to support the ministry of this church. Well, um, I look forward to seeing you again uh, next week, uh, maybe catching up with you uh, via a Zoom call or an email this week. Love you guys. Enjoy your day.